Hey everybody, thanks for showing up. I'm Tom Vassar, I'm in the Religious Studies Department, and I'm the Program Director for Environmental Studies Minor. And I actually had Ned, I could call him Ned because we're now colleagues, uh, in the spring of 1997, and I found my syllabus for that class. <laughs> and your colleagues don't know this, but for 19 years you've already been retired, because you have the same syllabus now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so most of you, if you're a minor in environmental studies, most of you have probably taken environmental ethics with Dr. Hedinger, which so he's done a lot of heavy lifting for the program for many years. Um, hope you even started back in the mid-90s. So the environmental studies minor would like to thank you for all your service to our program and the campus um, and for all you've done for <clears throat> inviting students to think about how they value the more than human world. And, and I know it's work because it worked for me, so thanks. Um, on behalf of the philosophy department, I was going to add a couple of words. I promise that we'll keep the time short. Um, so let me, for those of you who don't know, let me say a little bit by way of intellectual biography about uh, Professor Hedinger. Um, throughout his career, um, one of the things that's always struck me most about Ned is just how deeply committed he is to the scholarly life. Um, he's always been active in writing, always had projects going on, um, particularly these recent years of environmental and aesthetic topics. Um, over the course of his career, he's published over 30 articles, presented his work to professional audiences over 80 times, um, including keynote addresses at major international conferences. So he's had a very successful career. Um, as recognition of that, um, he served 10 years um, on the editorial board of the flagship journal Environmental Ethics. Um, in addition to all the scholarship, um, he's been a really dedicated teacher for us um, and has consistently served the department and the college and the broader professional community. Um, and I guess I want to say more importantly than all, than all that, I mean, that, those are sort of the traditional things, right, faculty do. More importantly than all that, Ned's just been a, a terrific guy. Um, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to have had you as a colleague um, for these years, Ned. Um, uh, you will be missed, and so I just want to take a small moment and congratulate you on the career. Wish you well um, in your retirement. Thanks, Tom. Speech, speech, speech. <laughs> He said he didn't want to do that. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Come on, man. So um, let's now um, move to the talk. Uh, before we have, before I actually introduce our speaker, one more little chore. Um, I want to thank some folks who uh, generously helped to make this event possible. Um, the Office of Sustainability um, and the graduate and undergraduate programs in environmental studies all helped to fund this, um, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without their support. So thanks to those groups. <laughs> Introducing a, a speaker. Um, so, very happy today to have Dale Jamison here. Uh, Dale's the chair of the Environmental Studies Department at New York University. He's been a prolific author. Um, he's written extensively on environmental issues, um, recently including work on global climate change. Um, but he has a number of other interests as well. Um, I've read and enjoyed uh, your work on uh, animal minds, animal cognition, um, and he's been very interested in um, animal ethics more broadly. Um, in addition to many articles, um, he's published uh, five books, um, including two books that are going to be for sale um, after the talk. So, uh, with that, welcome, Dale. Well. So, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in what is obviously a very, a very special occasion. And I'm afraid that I just turned things off. Okay. So, um, yeah, I didn't actually play with the electronics before. Let's see. Oh, yeah, I get it. Um, so, <laughs> unfortunately, Ned is going to have to set through a little more of this before we actually get to this. So, obviously, this is an occasion in honor of Ned Hedinger. Now, when I first met Ned, he looked a little bit different than he does today, but not so different. I mean, the beard is just sort of a different color, the hair is a different color, and he's obviously a little more into the badass look these days. <laughs> um, now, when Ned was at Boulder, where I first, where I first met him, 
Uh, he was actually working in, in metaphysics. Um, and this is a picture of Ned at a summer seminar with Hilary Putnam, and, uh, who just passed away two days ago, actually. And a lot of Ned's early work in graduate school was concerned with issues that were, that were pioneered by Putnam. But when Ned got out of graduate school, his interest soon turned or returned to issues in practical and applied ethics. And one of the things that I found particularly striking when I was sort of going back through Ned's career and thinking about it, is it's not just uh, that he's actually published quite a lot and consistently over the years, but most of the papers he's published have actually had very long lives and been very useful papers. So one of his first papers, What is Wrong with Reverse Discrimination, was published in 1987. It's been reprinted seven times, most recently in 2008. And it's pretty unusual for any philosophy paper to have that kind of longevity, but especially a, a paper that's devoted to a topic in practical ethics. And Ned was really one of the first people, I mean, most of us didn't know what intellectual property was in 1989 when Ned's paper on that topic appeared in Philosophy of Public Affairs. And in addition to that paper being reprinted a number of times. It was also included in the Philosopher's Annual, which is an annual publication that identifies the best papers in philosophy that are published in any particular year. And not many of us have ever really have the honor of having a paper uh, singled out and published in that way. And that happened to this paper of Ned's. Now, as has already been mentioned, his first love has really always been nature. So Ned has spent a lot of time in his life in places like this. Uh, emerging uh, to go <laughs> backpacking. Uh, <laughs> and to spend time in the mountains. So it's not surprising that his interests soon turn to issues in environmental ethics and environmental philosophy. And there have been these consistent themes throughout Ned's career. He's been really a champion of ideas of wildness, the importance of preserving wildness in nature, the, the importance of preserving naturalness, uh, also emphasizing the autonomy of nature, that nature does its own thing, and we ought to respect that. And in recent years, he's become very well known for this view called aesthetic protectionism. It's essentially a view that says that the aesthetic properties of nature provide very strong reasons to preserve nature. And there was a tradition of sort of being kind of embarrassed about making aesthetic arguments for the protection of nature. But Ned has done a lot to turn that tide. Uh, now, in doing this, he has really been aligned with a very long tradition of environmentalists and environmental thinkers, and I think can be thought of uh, as someone who writes in that tradition. Perhaps the most famous being John Muir, uh, who was the founder of the, the, of the Sierra Club. And this just gives you a sense, I think, of, of Muir's views, and you can, I think, begin to see some of the sources or some of the inspiration for Ned's own views. So Muir writes, I'm going to do this boring thing that you're never supposed to do, which is to read text off PowerPoints, okay, <laughs> and a parenthetical comment. The natural beauty hunger is made manifest in our magnificent na national parks, the Yellowstone, Yosemite, Sequoia, etc. Nature's sublime wonderlands, the admiration and joy of the world. Nevertheless, like anything else worthwhile, from the very beginning, however well guarded, they have always been subject to attack by despoiling game seekers and mischief makers of every degree from Satan to senators, <laughs> eagerly trying to make everything immediately as selfishly commercial. Now, Hetch Hetchy was a very special place in Yosemite that Muir spent much of his life trying to protect. There was a proposal for a dam there that was eventually built. Damn Hetch Hetchy, as well damn for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. So this gives you a sense of the kind of traditional emphasis on <coughs> nature preservation uh, that is fairly typical uh, in the history of American environmental thought. Now, in the 1980s, things start changing. And throughout the 1960s and 1970s, we got the Wilderness Act, we got the Endangered Species Act. Essentially, most of the environmental protection legislation that's been passed in the United States was passed during those years. And essentially what happens in the 1980s is that environmentalism goes on retreat. 
And I think in a very important respect, we can talk about this more in discussion, in a sense, environmentalism has never gotten its mojo back since, since the 1980s. The, the burden of proof, the kind of political presumptions in American society have never really returned to where they were with environmental protection in the late 1960s and 1970s after the 1980s. Now, um, so uh, the 1980s were also interesting because you know, what tends to happen with social movements is if they go on retreat, if they start to lose, you often also begin to get a kind of re-examination of what the prevailing values are, what's gone wrong, what is this movement really about. And so, in a way, weirdly, the 1980s were actually very good for some large environmental organizations because they were able to raise a lot of money in order to stop the kind of anti-environmental onslaught uh, that was coming from the Reagan administration. But it was also for uh, African American community, and there was a kind of resurgence of resistance and civil disobedience of the sort that hadn't been seen since the heyday of the civil rights movement at that time. So part of what the environmental justice movement was telling the environmental movement is it's not just wilderness, it's not just preservation, but there are really matters of life and death uh, that uh, concern poor people, people of color, that were not figuring in the environmental narrative at that time at that time. And this also spilled over into a kind of critique of the mainstream large environmental groups, which were largely staffed by uh, white males from relatively affluent backgrounds who liked to spend their time camping. Also, we began to see changes in the sciences. Uh, this work starts earlier than 1985, but in 1985 there was a major conference around the concept of Gaia. Uh, and the major thinkers in this area are James Lovelock, the sort of British eccentric scientist engineer, and Lynn Margolis, biologist at the University of Massachusetts. And what's important about Gaia, for our purposes, is was the rise of a way of looking at the Earth as essentially a set of interlocking systems. So the focus became on thinking of the Earth as a system where when you talk about, for example, preserving wildernesses, this is just sort of ripping out an area or a particular place. And in order to think about what preservation means, you need to think about the stability of particular systems. Now, this way of looking at things is in a way very different from the sort of environmental justice perspective. Essentially, the environmental justice perspective has a kind of pollution perspective. What's wrong with environmental problems, what they mean, what their source is, is essentially taking a pollutant and putting it someplace, usually damaging poor people or people of color. The Gaia Earth Systems approach essentially views environmental problems as uh, centering on the instability, the, the, the human perturbation of global systems in a way that's created instability in those systems, which is a very different way of looking at things than looking at things uh, from the pollution perspective. Uh, also, social constructionist views that uh, were and are still, in many ways, quite prominent in some areas of the social sciences and humanities, also began to be increasingly influential in the 80s and kind of culminate in this 1995 article by the environmental historian William Cronin called The Trouble with Wilderness. And the idea is that the wilderness concept is essentially a kind of social construction uh, that is valued by some people, but, but not by others, that there's no sort of intrinsic reality to the idea of wilderness. And so when environmentalists focus on wilderness preservation, they're essentially focusing on protecting something that they themselves have, have created, thus overlooking uh, the importance of, of other kinds of environmental values. 1988, Bill McKinnon publishes The End of Nature, which is really the first popular book on climate change essentially says that because of climate change, we're now at a time in which nature, in the sense of something that's pristine, something that's unaffected by human action and human behavior has now come to an end. We're in a new kind of era uh, as a result. And then although it's published later, in a way you can see it as kind of the culmination of these trends. In 2004, uh, Schellenberger and Nordhaus write a kind of discussion paper that's first sent around to a bunch of environmental grants making uh, organizations and eventually then enters the great literature and eventually becomes a book called The Death of Environmentalism. 
And they're basically saying environmentalism has run its course. It's no longer a useful political concept in American society. We need to do something different. We need to think about these problems in different ways. So there's a sense then in which the reverses of the 1980s throw the whole idea of environmentalism into a kind of crisis or at least a kind of rethink. And what gets layered on top of that is this idea of the Anthropocene. So Paul Crutzen was a Nobel Prize winning chemist. He was one of the atmospheric chemists who did the work on the ozone hole. Uh, in 2000, he says, I was at a conference where someone said something about the Holocene. I suddenly thought this was wrong. The world has changed too much. So I said, no, we are in the Anthropocene. I just made up the word on the spur of the moment. Everyone was shocked, but it seems to have stopped. <laughs> now, as is often the case when people think they're making things up in the spur of the moment. The term Anthropocene had already been coined by a relatively obscure limnologist at Michigan State University named Eugene Sturmer. And, uh, and Crutzen, to his credit, then later did give credit uh, to Sturmer. And they actually wrote a paper together on the idea of the Anthropocene. Um, but it is interesting, the sort of history of the term. Andy Revkin, who for many years was the chief environment correspondent uh, reported from the New York Times, published a book in 1992 in which he used the word anthrocene. It's kind of interesting why Andy Revkin never became famous for this, and why we're not talking about the anthrocene. Is it the importance of the syllable, Paul? Right? There isn't maybe the Times were not yet quite right for thinking about this. But the Anthropocene is generally understood in this way, as when people talk about the Anthropocene, they're talking about an epoch in Earth's history in which humanity is a geological force, or perhaps the dominant geological force. And we'll talk more about this later. Uh, but it's important, I think, to recognize that this idea of the importance of the human impact on nature was not a new idea. That we have this, this term, the Anthropocene, has its own history, which I been tracing. But the idea uh, occurs in the 19th century and arguably earlier. George Perkins Marsh, who was kind of, uh, you know, one of those kind of great, crazy 19th century American autodidacts who, uh, who did 19 things, including inventing new ways of or having kitchen sinks and whatever, uh, wrote a very important book called Man and Nature. It was published under several titles, but, but it was originally Man and Nature, published in 1864. And he writes, there are parts of Asia Minor, of Northern Africa, of Greece, and even of Alpine Europe, where the operation of causes set in motion, in action by man, has brought the face of the earth to a desolation almost as complete as that of the moon. And though within that brief space of time, which we call the historical period, they are known to have been covered with luxuriant woods, verdant pastures, and fertile meadows. They are now too far deteriorated to be reclaimable by man, nor can they become again fitted for human use, except through great geological changes or other mysterious influences or agencies of which we have no present knowledge and over which we have no perspective control. So Marsh is essentially describing the Anthropocene, and he's saying it's a bad thing. Now, uh, also, a little after Marsh, there was an Italian cleric and geologist, Antonio Stefani, who also had more or less the same idea in a course of lectures on geology that he gave in 18, that were published in 1873. And he says, it is in this sense precisely that I do not hesitate in proclaiming the Anthropozoic Era. So another attempted nomenclature that didn't quite stick, but anyway. We are only at the beginning of the new era. Still, how deep is man's footprint on Earth already? Man has been in possession of it for only a short time. Yet how many geological phenomena may we inquire regarding the causes not in telluric agents, atmosphere, waters, animals, but instead in man's intellect, his intruding and powerful will? The Anthropozoic era has begun. Now you can already get a sense that Stefani thought it was kind of a good thing. Right? This, is, this is an expression of human intellect 
uh, and creativity. So already you begin to get this idea of the bad Anthropocene in Marsh. You know, we've, we've turned parts of the Earth into something that looks like a, like a moonscape or like Mars, and beginning to get the idea of the good Anthropocene in Stepanian. Now, uh, just to put this a little bit in perspective, this period that we're talking about, so changes of epoch usually uh, come about through variation in solar radiation, orbital variations, volcanic activity, and so on. There are other cases where changes of epoch come because of the physical or chemical effects of life. Most famously, oxygen appeared in the atmosphere uh, because of photosynthesis, because of the operation of life on Earth. There would be no oxygen. And arguably, that transformation on the part of, uh, of, of single cell organisms was actually much greater than the current human transformation of the planet. I mean, turning, uh, 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 creating oxygen is pretty, pretty big deal. Uh, so if we, if we look at this, if the Earth is about, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's better to point at one side or point at no side. So maybe you, given equality, I won't point at you. So if the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, uh, we start getting into the part that we're interested in, which is the so-called uh, age of mammals, which is, starts about 66 million uh, years ago, which is a very small fraction of the entire history of the planet. Uh, within the uh, age of mammals, we have the transition from apes to hominids, which occurs at about 5.3 million years ago, which again is a very small fraction of the Cenozoic period. Uh, and then within that period, when we make the transition from apes to hominids, uh, it's about 100,000 years ago that we get anatomically modern, modern humans, where we have the kind of bipedalism and the kind of brain size that we we African apes who are sitting in this room have today. Uh, and then from 100,000 years ago, essentially every, virtually everything that we associate with human culture and civilization has occurred in a 10,000 year period. And uh, I didn't put the slide in, but this 10,000 year period, which is the period of the Holocene, is a period in which uh, all sorts of planetary systems were unusually stable in terms of climate, uh, in terms of the composition of the atmosphere and so on. So I think it's, a, it's important to recognize that almost everything we think of about human culture and civilization has occurred at a time in which this planet has been unusually quiet and unusually stable. And then uh, what we see if we, if we drill down on the Holocene a little, a little more deeply is we see this sort of amazing exponential growth in population uh, and the way that it tracks on political organization from semi-nomadic groups uh, to city-states to empires to nation-states to globalization. And it looked like when Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson River, first white contact. If you'd have been flying over in a helicopter, this is for an airplane, this is what we would have seen. So this is about as good a picture of the Anthropocene as you might want to have. In other words, you can talk about Anthropocene markers and domination and all kinds of other things, but if you just want to point to somebody what they're talking about when you're talking about the Anthropocene, this is a pretty good image of the human transformation of nature moving from a, from a, from a time and a place when nature had its way to a time and a place in which humanity is the dominant force. Another way of looking at this is, uh, uh, is seeing what has happened to the biomass of animal life uh, on the planet in the time in which we live. This is a little bit hard graph to read, and it doesn't take into account bacteria. Apparently, the biomass of bacteria is actually greater than that of this. I mean, this is a sort of minority of the biomass on the planet, but putting aside bacteria. Essentially, what this is telling you is uh, this is the biomass of humanity. Um, these are the biomass of wild animals, elephants in this case, various species that are related to ungoids here, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this are domestic, the biomass of domesticated animals, animals that people use for various purposes. So essentially, almost all of the biomass on the planet when it comes to animals is essentially human beings or 
domestic animals that human beings have domesticated to use for their own purposes. Another pretty good marker of what people are talking about when they talk about the Anthropocene. Now, what's supposed to happen this year is that this organization that has this rather Orwellian name, the International Commission on Stratigraphy, I mean, you sort of expect them to like break into your house somewhere and do something unspeakable to your dog or something. But anyway, they're going to make a decision, supposedly, this year about whether, in fact, we've entered this new geological era of the Anthropocene. And there's some problems here in doing this. One problem is that they're interested in geological epochs. So they're interested in what is encoded in the surface of the planet. They don't care about a lot of the data, a lot of the indicators I've shown you. They want to know whether there is a marker in the Earth's crust of this. And there's some skepticism about this. There's some skepticism about dating. When, when, when did the Anthropocene start? What exactly is the marker? And what happens to the poor old Holocene, right? I showed you all that geological time scale, and the Holocene is like being strangled in its cradle. I mean, it just appeared 10,000 years ago. What are we going to say that, well, the Holocene turns out to be a really, 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 really brief geological epoch? Or are we going to say, Holocene? Well, that was a mistake. <laughs> no, it's always been the Anthropocene, right? So there's kind of a slightly embarrassing question when you declare an epoch and now uh, you've got this other one following it so quickly. Um, and already we're seeing these kind of amazingly sort of polarized debates about the Anthropocene coming from uh, the social sciences and the humanities and from environmental studies. Uh, Earl Ellis, who's a geographer at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, says, for the first time we are changing the way the entire planet functions. This is an amazing opportunity. <laughs> Humanity has now made the leap to an entirely new level of planetary importance. As Stuart Brand said in 1968, where is God's? They might as well get good at it. Right? It's the good Anthropocene. It's a good thing. It's like Stepani's view. Uh, I mean, Christ, who is a professor at Virginia Tech, says the Anthropocene discourse clings to the almighty power of that jaded abstraction man and to the promised land his God posturing might yet deliver him, namely a planet managed for the production of resources and governed for the containment of risks. Right? Anthropocene as an evil. Now, in a way, all of this good Anthropocene, bad Anthropocene goes back to this disaggregation of environmentalism. There really have always been these different tendencies in environmental thought that really started to come out in the 1980s. The one tendency can be seen uh, in someone who's not as well known as he should be, namely Bob Marshall. Bob Marshall was the founder of the Wilderness Society was an important figure in the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And more than anyone, he's really responsible for the Wilderness Act, although the legacy came long after his death, and the creation of wilderness systems. And as you can see, he's another guy like John Muir, who liked to strap on backpacks and spend time in wilderness areas. But Mr. Fuller, on the other hand, was the person who coined the metaphor of spaceship Earth and invented the geodesic dome. And there's another notion of environmentalism, which is, as it were, high-tech and postmodern. that what we need to do is be hyper-efficient about everything we do to reduce our footprint, um, and think of ourselves as being this little lonely garden of life in an empty universe that's otherwise full of void, and environmentalism means efficient, efficiency about that. And there have always been these two faces of environmentalism, and they come out in really sort of odd ways, I think, in a lot of everyday behavior. So free and independent. We want, to, we want to be free and independent in nature. We want nature to be free and independent. So what do we have? We have this boat uh, with a bunch of people jumping off of it, being free and independent in free and independent nature. Well, there's kind of a paradox here, right, in terms of what it took for them to get there. Uh, and what uh, and, and the materials that go into the boat, but it's not just sort of people with yachts. Uh, it's backpackers, right? I mean, if you actually look at this picture, here's some people going off in a wilderness experience. Um, the the wilderness is a very, I mean, no doubt is quite wild in the area, but you can see how conventionalized the experience is. We've got maps, we've got signposts, we've got rules. 
uh, and look at the equipment we have. Even the dog has backpacks. Well, first of all, there is a dog. I mean, that's sort of bringing a domesticated, uh, you know, these African apes who themselves are exotic species and from the Pacific Crest Trail are bringing their domesticated uh, uh, animals formerly known as wolves along with them. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, and I think, it, it, so this is kind of basic backpacking equipment and it would be interesting to actually think about the embedded carbon and the embedded energy in the production of all these tools uh, that we need in order to have these wilderness experiences. But it's not just, uh, and, and also since the 1970s, there's been a big uh, explosion of this sort of activity in, in, in terms of people seeking wilderness experiences uh, around the world, a kind of explosion of the kind of Western model of backpacking. Now, personally, I'm especially interested in surfing because I grew up surfing in Southern California, although I was never very good at it. Um, and this was sort of my idea of surfing, uh, as I say. Not that I was good at good. It's sort of a lonely surfer on the perfect wave. One other person who's probably your buddy because it's better. No, I think better than catching a perfect wave alone is to have somebody see you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but only one person. <laughs> but what's happened to surfing is a lot about like what's happened to other nature experiences. Uh, it's kind of become an extreme sport. So who would not want to be on that wave? I mean, that's just so incredible. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to imagine where we would like to be on that wave. But when you're talking about trying to be on a wave like that, nobody can paddle out to catch that wave. That's impossible. So what you, the kind of other side of that picture is this, right? Because the only way you can get out to catch that wave is to be towed on jet ski essentially out beyond the break so you can catch the wave and try to come in. So, uh, so, so a lot of our wilderness nature experiences have become extreme sports experiences that kind of carry this tension between them, between the postmodern materials, efficient materials, high-tech materials, take a lot of energy inputs so that we can go out and have the natural experience. This is a friend of mine in New York. Uh, the place where people go surfing in New York is Rockaway Beach. And it's a friend of mine who's kind of a fanatic surfer. We call this surfing in the Anthropocene. Uh, so anyway. So we have this idea of the good Anthropocene. You know, and the argument for this basically goes that, well, people have always modified their environments. There's nothing new about this. And then the second argument is that really it's a good thing that people modify their environments. So, it's a quotation from Peter Kareva, scientists have coined a name for our era, the Anthropocene, to emphasize that we have entered a new geological era. Most people worldwide welcome opportunities that development provides to improve lives and find rural poverty. So the Anthropocene goes with poverty reduction, all these things that people want. Then we have this, arg this argument that the Anthropocene is a bad thing, and this is quoting something from Ned, it's not directly on the Anthropocene, but about the kind of environmentalism that endorses the Anthropocene is a good thing. And he says, this manifests a culpable failure to appreciate the profound role non-human nature continues to play on Earth, right? So the first point is wrong. It isn't that we've always been Anthropocene. Non-human nature still plays an important role on Earth. And also an arrogant overvaluation of humans' role and authority, right? And a sense of entitlement about this. So we have this debate about the Anthropocene, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But I want to go back and say, well, like Sigmund Freud was rumored to have said, although there's no documentary evidence that he actually said it, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and sometimes a category is just a category. Um, and at least at the level of geology, the question about the Anthropocene is about a category, but whether this is a useful category. And sometimes how we categorize things uh, is, is, is important, is value-laden. So if you categorize a plant as a weed, for example, or an animal as a pest, or a person as a bug, if they fall into those categories, this has implications about how you can treat them. What? So sometimes categories matter. But other times, a category is just a category. Right? It's, it, it doesn't go with those kind of implications. Now, geological categories are somewhere in between these kind of value-laden categories and these logical ones. And it's interesting that the term Holocene itself was not invented until 1867. 
wasn't proposed as an epic until 1885, and the USGS didn't buy into it until 1967, right? There's a whole history of fighting about the Holocene. So why is it that we're all in a twist about the Anthropocene and people don't go around denouncing the Holocene? Well, part of it is when we're born into a period where all of the salami's been made and the work has been done and the fighting is over, we just take it for granted as an objective feature of the world, right? The war is over, this is the Holocene. But of course, the other thing has to do with the name an epic with a term that refers to humans is to glorify humanity. But I don't see why that's so. We talk about the dark ages without implying that darkness is a good thing. Uh, if you talk about Chinese history, we talk about the period of the warring states without endorsing the idea of warring states. Right? So I don't actually see why for the purposes of categorization this matters. And I think, I think the philosopher Henri Bergson, who during his time was the most influential philosopher in the world and now mostly unread, actually had it exactly right. He says, in thousands of years, our wars and revolutions will count for little, but the steam engine and the procession of inventions of every kind that accompanied it will perhaps be spoken of as we speak of the bronze or of the chipped stone of prehistoric times. It will serve to define an age. What I think we're really interested in is the Anthropocene as a cultural and moral category. And here I'm just going to make some very quick claims in the interest of saving some time, uh, but they're all things we can talk about. And I think the Anthropocene is a particular period in human history that is marked by the collective human domination of nature that's fed by large populations <coughs> and high levels of consumption. And this rests on the power of technology, which allows action at a distance, both spatially and temporally. And I think we see this not just with environmental problems like climate change, but with issues like drone strikes, where somebody now sitting in front of a monitor in Las Vegas can actually make a life and death decision about someone on the other side of the world, completely uh, impossible previously. Uh, or issues about famine relief, where, you know, in the 19th century, when a good liberal philosopher like Henry Sidgwick was sitting in the senior common room in Cambridge and reading about famine in India, there was nothing he could really do about it, right? But now you can go on the internet and you can do a few clicks and you can empty out your bank account in favor of Doctors Without Borders. Right? This is a real possibility for you. The, uh, the Anthropocene also brings a loss of privacy, a great deal of transparency, and I think also the breakdown of distinct domains of life. I'm not going to go into that now, but we can talk about that later. But I think what this leads to is a kind of erosion of a sense of individual responsibility and an increase in a sense of complicity, and it's hard to tell them apart. So we all know that we're part of some causal chain that leads to climate change, that supports sweatshop labor uh, in developing countries, and so on and so forth. But we don't really, but are we causes of this? Are we responsible for this? Are we just complicit in it? And if we're just complicit, what does it mean to be complicit in it? What exactly is our responsibility? We no longer have this sense of, I'm decisive over this or not decisive over this. And so we live in an age of sort of universal complicity, but yet most of us don't actually feel causal responsibility for these problems. Um, and I think this puts pressure on common sense morality, the kind of morality we grew up on, which sharply distinguishes, for example, duties to family, friends, fellow believers, and fellow citizens from duties to strangers, duties to the near and dear as opposed to those who are distant, duties from humans, duties to animals. All these categories start running together in the Anthropocene. And so I think what we have is a kind of failure of common sense morality to help us think about the kinds of problems that we face in the Anthropocene. This is an example I've used for years. Some of you have probably seen it before. But start with a case where our moral intuitions are really clear. Jack intentionally steals Jack's bicycle. Jack is the aggressor, he's bad. Uh, Jill suffers a harm. Um, very simple case, our, 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 our common sense morality gains traction. But as we vary the case along different dimensions to try to mirror how it is when we emit carbon and we cause damages to distant people, our intuitions, Silicon Valley technology of the day, uh, 
And now we're living in a world of more than 7 billion people in which money, resources, and power span the globe with a single click of a mouse. It's not surprising that the traditional moralities which we grew up with are not adequate to regulating behavior uh, in such dense populations with such technological power. So, uh, this is from a recent book by two French historians called The Shock of the Anthropocene, and they say, the Anthropocene is the sign of our power, but also of our impotence. I think that's a wonderful summary. Together, we create these outcomes. Humanity is very powerful. Together, we create these outcomes. But yet, we feel unable to pull back from producing those outcomes. Together we create outcomes we don't want, and individually we feel powerless to stop. So what does that mean? Well, that means that a place like Torrey Pines, where I grew up surfing, uh, is going to radically change. Uh, the Torrey Pine uh, will probably become extinct uh, in the next 20 or 30 years, and this name Torrey Pine will become like the grizzly bear on the California flag, state flag, right? A kind of requiem for for what's been lost uh, as a result of human action. And as the good Professor Erwin Corey once said, if we don't change direction soon, we'll end up where we're going. <laughs> now, the first thing we should recognize is that we actually know that humanity will become extinct. There's the Anthropocene and what, and what it will lead to. There's no physical necessity of this. There's no logical necessity of this. We know humanity itself will become extinct one day. And there's a wonderful book that, uh, that some of you may know, which considers what would happen if human, if human beings simply disappeared from the planet at the snap of a finger. And this is essentially a chart that shows you how the Earth begins to recover. And a lot, along a lot of dimensions, things recover very, very quickly once humanity disappears. There are other things, for example, glass and plastics take about 50,000 years to degrade. Uh, but a lot of stuff begins to change very quickly. So, so in terms of a physical possibility, we know there's no inevitability into going more deeply into the Anthropocene. And we also know, in fact, that in some sense, someday the Earth will revert to become a different planet that's no longer affected by humanity in the way that it is. And so I think we have to ask what it means then for us to live in the Anthropocene. And one thing it's going to mean, as I've already mentioned, is a kind of mourning, because we are going to lose a lot of stuff. We have lost a lot of stuff. We're going to lose more. Uh, there's no turning back from that. It's also going to mean that some people are going to be even at more risk than they are already. For example, subsistence farmers in Bangladesh who live uh, just above sea level now who are going to have to cope with sea level rise. For kind of rich people in the developed world, it, a lot of things are going to cost more money. Uh, there's going to be the drumbeat of unstable weather. You're going to lose things, but life will kind of go on. But the really profound issue here has to do with agency, with trying to gain some control over who we are and the world that we want to bring about. And some of that has to do with politics, but some of that gets into what it is to live a green life. And uh, in other places, I talk about what I call the green virtues. And the point of trying to develop the green virtues is not because through individual action that each of us becoming good, you know, recycling a lot or whatever, or is, is going to re reverse the Anthropocene. But it's by being able to put your life under the control of your own ideals that you begin to restore a sense of agency. And it's only by beginning to restore a sense of agency that we can move beyond the kind of paralysis in which together we create these outcomes that none of us as individuals actually want to bring about. And of course, one of these great virtues is love. And it's been mentioned, I have a recent book uh, of short stories called Love in the Anthropocene, uh, and co-written with Bonnie Nanzi. And so then to just summarize what I've been trying to say, environmentalism itself is in a very dynamic state, a lot of internal conflict, trying to understand what it means to be 
to, to be an environmentalist in the Anthropocene. There's a debate about the Anthropocene as a geological category, but basically non-geologists should just chill out about it. It doesn't really matter to the things that most of us care about. But the Anthropocene is an important cultural and moral category that we need to be thinking about, mostly around this erosion of the sense of agency. And it is still up to us how deep we go into the Anthropocene. And the most important problem we face in the Anthropocene, misspelled, I see, is the recovery of agency. And, oh yeah, Ben <laughs> If I'm having trouble answering a question, though, feel free to answer. <laughs> yeah. So we can also put on some lights or something too. We don't. So it's so no one falls asleep during the question. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks very much. Um, like I like where the argument goes that by restoring a sense of agency will increase our experience of responsibility. But I wondered if a couple of the cases you gave were in tension with that. So. You were talking about how the increase in complicity leads to the erosion of personal responsibility, and two examples you gave was Ben Relief and Drone Strikes. But I thought that those two pushed in the other direction. So you were sort of suggesting that pre-internet era, if one, like Henry Sedgwick, had the experience of knowing about famine and not feeling able to do anything, well, it's the opposite now. We have the power to do something. So we have more power, so you'd think that my ability to kill someone on the other side of the planet, to personally push a button and end a light, would increase in our feelings of responsibility. So that of those two pushed in the complete opposite direction. So do you think the person who's watching the TV screen and pushes the button feels responsible for killing the person on the other side of the world? I should think so. Um, I think some people think the impersonality of it, that it's a person on a screen and not a human body, might be contributing in, to it. But I mean, I think the connection of push button person die. Like, you're responsible. That person is actually getting permission to push the button from someone else who's part of the system, who who has authority, who is referring to a certain manual about the conditions under which this can be done which is being gauged against this video feed where people are trying to figure out whether the conditions are satisfied. And it's an empirical question. I've talked to one person who does those things. I don't claim to have encyclopedia knowledge of people who push buttons and kill people with drones. But I think they see themselves as part of a system. Um, I've seen other reporting that said the opposite, like people quit because yeah. they couldn't handle being in that room where that was happening. Sure. Um, I also people know quit jobs with corporations. But I mean, people don't like being parts of systems that produce outcomes that, that they don't that they don't like. But it's a very different situation. Think about, for example, George Orwell uh, wrote a book called Homage to Catalonia when he he basically joined an anarchist group during the Spanish Civil War and he went through all this stuff to get there to the front, you know, to to kill fascists. And there's this line in this book where he finally gets to the front gone through all this stuff to get there. He's sitting there with his rifle, and he sees this soldier wallowing out of an outhouse. And he says, I came here to kill fascists. I didn't come to kill guys coming out of outhouses, right? There's a, I mean, the old style of warfare, for better or for worse, had that kind of personal dimension that I think that the, the war by a drone doesn't, doesn't actually have. So anyway, it, it, it's a, it, these are complicated questions, but that's why I see it as an expression uh, of, 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 of sort of anthropocentric logic as opposed to something else. But yeah. Uh, just, just a point, and this isn't about that, but uh, could you speak a little more? They have shown that like people who fly drones are beginning to have PTSD, similar to s subjects in real wars, which means that they are experiencing the same emotions. I have a different question, but. Um, yeah, I mean, so part of what's complicated about this, you know, is I know people, for example, who try to live lives of zero impact, who really do feel incredibly morally responsible for 
little bits of carbon that they emit. That, that they emit. So it's not as though nobody has a kind of consciousness of individual moral responsibility for these global collective problems. Some people do, and I think in some way increasingly people do. It's just that in a certain way, they are kind of mad relative to the prevailing systems of, of, of morality that we have. Yeah? Um, my other question was, you're suggesting that the Anthropocene is something social, something cultural. Please I, be louder again, I'm sorry. Um, you're suggesting that the Anthropocene is something social, something cultural. A lot of your examples entail something that's very modern, post-industrial era. And I'm a geologist, so I'm slightly skewed. But um, generally, the thought is that the initial findings that would define the Anthropocene are actually found at the beginning of the industrial era. In fact, at the beginning of you know developed agriculture in the sense that we have now, which I, I don't know how you would relate. Do you think the cultural and moral norms go back to when we started agriculture? Or do you think they are truly a subject of the modern era? So what I'm saying is there's a confusion in the discussion about the Anthropocene. That one discussion is just a geological debate, right? That doesn't really have any particular moral or cultural import. But what's happened is a lot of people who are concerned with the value questions have sort of fastened on to the geological dispute as if something of great cultural and moral importance rests on whether the International Commission on Stratigraphy decides one way or another about the advocacy. Okay? And what I'm trying to say is there is something that people are concerned about here, a really deep and important question, and it's about how we live in an era which is radically different from the era of, of of, of really just two or three generations ago, uh, and signal that in one discussion, and it's being used to signal this geological dispute in another discussion. So let's just separate those discussions. Let's let the geologists do their thing, right? And whatever the International Commission on Stratigraphy decides, it's not going to free us or even affect very much the real discussion that we need to have, which is, I think, about restoring a sense of agency in a world in which humanity as a collective is enormously powerful and we as individuals we just don't feel powerful. I hope that clarifies it. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask this question about agency where, um, this goes back in part to what Rachel was asking, but the difference between thinking about um, asking people to rethink ideas of agency across space versus across time. Um, because I think in some sense, this, this spatial case, we can, in part, answer, right? We can figure out, so what are people who are doing drone strikes? What are they thinking? What goes on? What does that mean to us? But in that sense, right, we know, as you said, then there's the person who's ordering the person who did the drone strike. But, you know, 400 years ago, there was a king in a castle who was ordering someone 300 miles away, 500 miles away, not in that quick period of time, but still making an order that was going to cause lots of deaths. But I think the harder one is the, gener the justice between generations part. What does it mean to get our generation to care, not even so much about our potential grandchildren, but right so far away that, that it has nothing to do with us. But it does have to do with the idea of humanity, such that we should care what life is like on Earth in 500 years. And how do you get people to think about that? So I think they're all hard. And in a way, the problem with the Anthropocene is they don't stay separate. So, um, so I can, for example, look at my bank account, and I can allocate a certain amount for my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Or I can, I mean, I can just do this at the computer in real time. I mean, I don't have to like write wills and things like that. I mean, and I can allocate a certain amount to immediately respond to the horrors that are occurring in South Sudan right now. Um, and um, in the kind of argument that someone like Peter Singer makes, which is the marginal utility is actually much greater in one place rather than another, is an argument that I don't think can really be defeated. I mean, it is true for every marginal dollar. It probably would produce more benefits if you, if you put it over there. So if you, if you, if you see, see, so traditional, traditional liberalism viewed the world as being divided into spheres. So there's a public sphere, there's a private sphere, my children are the private sphere, taking care of my children is private, this other stuff is public. As long as, 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 as my action doesn't affect others, then it's beyond the reach of morality and so on and so forth. 
But part of what happens when you have population density technolo and technological power is, it, is you can no longer preserve the distinction between the public and the private sphere. So taking your kids to soccer practice now is an act that has public implications because it contributes to climate change. So you can't just say, oh, that's a private act because everyone in performing these private acts is actually what's transforming the planet. So, so I think they're all hard. And, uh, and I think the future generations, one opens up in particular when you talk about the distant future, uh, uh, just a lot of enormously difficult issues about even having a clue what the desires and preferences of future people would be. And the only thing I would say about the military example is just that command and control makes a huge difference. It's one thing for the king to say, you guys go off and sack you know, the Holy Land, and these are the rules of engagement. And it's another thing for these systems to be really tightly bound in, in real time. And um, so, uh, yeah, I think you had your hand. Do you have any thoughts on the state and direction of medicine in this epic? Because really, you say fundamentally the same thing. Medicine's out of control. Money's out of control. You can take care of somebody across the world. Do you have any thoughts of that, that participation? Well, the only thought I have, which is, um, so most of the thoughts they have about the future come to, we know much less about it than we imagine that we do. And, and one of the things that happens when people think about the future is that we tend to take whatever issue we're most interested in and we extend that out into the future and we sort of forget that life is going to be changing on a whole range of other dimensions as well. So, uh, so, so let's suppose, it, it, it's very hard to put it there. So some of us will think about, what's it gonna be like to live in a climate change world in 2020? Well, and we tend to think it's like now only with climate change, but it might be like now only uh, rich people live to be 350 on average, right? H how does that affect everything else that's going on in the economy, in the society, and how people are thinking about their lives? And honestly, one of the reasons that I got involved in trying to write fiction is because in fiction, you can try to paint a more coherent picture of the, of the future than you can when you're doing things in a more um, kind of non-fiction way. So I don't have any answers. It's just that all of those things are going to be interacting with each other in ways that are almost impossible to uh, anticipate. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. It's such an honor that you came here, um, and we appreciate it. I'm wondering if I can ask more about um, maybe the, the best case of personal norms. So the people who live their lives making no impact, they may be taking on responsibility they don't actually have. I'm not sure if that's what you're saying. But they may also be tricking themselves in a way, as I want to ask. I, I'm, I've read enough uh, behavioral science lately that I get, we trick ourselves all the time, like this is what we do. But we do it uh, with how we think of ourselves, so a self-conception might help us to get some rules that we're motivated to follow. And I'm wondering if you'd be opposed or real open to the idea of us tricking ourselves into thinking our choices matter, or into tricking ourselves into responsibility we have, don't have actually, or tricking ourselves into thinking there's a kind of person we need to be regardless of impact. Okay, so that's a really good question. And um, I, I would think about it with some slightly different concepts. I mean, I don't think of it as tricking ourselves. What I think of it as, so we start with a certain biological, I mean, part, I mean, part of the problem here is we do tend to think of ourselves as gods, as sort of omniscient, all know, knowing, and so on. But actually, we really are these um, apes that sort of evolved in the African savanna, and there's some things we do really well, and there's some things, lots of things we don't do very well at all. And, uh, and a, you know, a few tens of thousands of years of human evolution hasn't improved those things. So, for example, we're pretty good at, um, at responding to the uh, rapid movements of middle-sized objects, but we're pretty bad at responding to things uh, that are very small, that don't have detectable smells, and so on. So, I mean, if you think of even just some, something simple like climate change, if, if carbon dioxide smelled horrible and was this disgusting green color, and when you looked out the window and you looked at cars, all you saw was this horrible, disgusting, repulsive color and this repellent smell, we would have done something about climate change. 
And the fact that I can give you a million graphs which represent the same facts, you all nod and say, oh, what a terrible thing, let's pass cap and trade or something, right? So we kind of come at this whole thing in the first place with a certain set of cognitive and affective abilities. We're terrible about thinking about the future generally. Um, we, oh, you know, when it comes to balancing losses versus gains, I mean, it, I mean, all of this stuff. And this is just kind of where we start. So I don't see it as a matter of tricking us. It's a matter of trying to frame our, our, our ideals of the sort of people we should be in ways that are consistent with our biological and cultural inheritance. And one of the ways that things can go wrong is, I mean, I think with the whole green virtue thing, is that, I mean, another thing I think the Anthropocene makes impossible is the maintenance of any idea of moral purity, right? We just know too much, and we think now much too holistically. So if you build a house out of, um, you know, uh, organic materials that are like the blah, 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 blah. I can still come along and say, what about all those critters who were living there before you put the house there? You know, and how is this going to, I mean, I mean, there's always going, going bigger, be going more macro. So ideas of moral purity, I think, only will make us crazy in this kind of age. So there's a guy, for example, who's kind of a friend of mine named Colin Bevan, who's, who wrote a book and made a movie called No Impact Man. And he spent a year trying to live a life in New York City without any environmental impact at all. Now, Colin is not in this way crazy. He didn't think that this was, he was being a role model for how everyone ought to, leave, ought to live all the time. He was really doing this as an experiment. And, uh, but there are people who think they can live that way. And that's not going to be a realizable ideal for humanity. This is, I mean, we're not going to. We're not going to start backtracking on the Anthropocene because we're all going to become no impact men. It, so I don't know if that is that okay. Yeah. Okay, my hand was up. Oh, your hand was up. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I had a question about the shrinking agency and and how how would it be the case given. Uh, the, the conditions of like uh, pollution and the amount of plastics in consumer products and that shocking figure of like how long it takes for plastics to break down and just how bombarded we are with plastics and styrofoam all day. That's what it means. Yeah, well in a way you sort of have to um, reconsider what agency means to you in a, in a, in a mass society, right? So, um, so sometimes if you just take the political cause, people will say like, ah, I went out and I demonstrated against that war and they didn't stop it the next day. Totally ineffectual I was. I'm never doing that again. I'm going bowling, right? Um, so like that's a way of feeling like I have no power and no resources. But suppose you define agency as I'm going to live my life as someone who's not down with that program, you know? So I'm going to go out and I'm going to demonstrate against that war. I've now acted in accordance with my values. That's an empowering experience, right? Be because I'm living in accordance with the values that I embrace. Ultimately, I have no control, really, over what happens in the world at the macro level. But I do have control about how I relate to that. And if you start to define agency in that sense, it becomes empowering. Um, but, but if you define agency in terms of outcomes in mass societies with great concentration, so the short answer is you change the goalposts. And you change them back to something that is humanly livable from an incredibly alienating sense of what we think we should be able to do as individuals. Let's see, you asked the question already, so I should go to someone else. Yeah. Uh, so an ideal utopian sustainable world, possibly in the future, uh, do you see uh, sustainable systems arising out of micro uh, individuals all doing a collective good, um, you know, similar to Jack and Jill hypothesis, and uh, or do you see it coming from like a top-down policy perspective uh, with more governmental institutions supplying the systems necessary? So it has to be both. Uh, because these things are never really independent. Because what happens is you don't really get government action unless individuals are willing to accept 
those restraints and those values that the government wants to. So take something like smoking. You, did, you didn't really get laws that ban smoking in public places until a lot of people started to think of indoor air as something, clean air as something they had a right to. And they didn't want people to live it. And when that kind of individual action reached some level of critical mass, then it became safe to regulate against now the minority who wanted to pollute indoor air. So it has to be something like that. It has to be kind of this interaction between individual action. I mean, it's like, I live in New York. One of my issues is bike, is biking. I'm a crazy bicycle person in New York. And I used to ride my bike when it was like, it was, it was like a suicide death trip. And enough people really took their lives in their hands, riding their bikes in the streets of New York, that we now have a great system of bike lanes. You know, because, because the, sit, the, the policy makers essentially respond to the preferences that people are expressing by engaging in the action. So there's always this kind of interaction between individual action and political action. Can't separate them. Yes? Do you think there's any way that one can source and consume meat um, that's compatible with a sustainable lifestyle in this era? That one can source and consume meat that's um, compatible with a sustainable lifestyle? Well, first of all, in a way, part of what I was saying is, I don't like terms like sustainable, first of all, because, uh, I mean, one reason is it can just mean so many things. Uh, and when it comes to doing the sort of thing I'm talking about, which is adopting something like the Green Virtues and trying to take control of your own, your own life and live according to your values, since I don't think moral purity is possible, there are going to be different places on that dial where people are going to set it. You know? So some people are going to be vegan and ride airplanes, and other people are going to eat meat and ride bicycles and never set foot in there. So these trade-offs are going to happen in different ways. But for most people, the single thing you can do that's easy to lessen your impact is to eat less meat. So in that sense, it's a, it's a, that even though a lot of people don't like hearing it, it's kind of an environmental no-brainer in that sense. Because it's something that you have immediate control of in everyday life. And the animal that you're eating if it's, a, if it's beef, is a big producer of methane. And the way that we grow beef in this country is they're essentially just the output of fossil fuel energy anyway. And so it's just very easy to back away from that one. So do you think it's like um, meat consumption is like a crucial problem to uh, like the environment or no? Well, it's a, it's a, okay, it's a big, so here's the thing. So, Obviously, different kinds of animal agriculture produce different kinds of problems. You know, you talk about um, intensive raising of pigs, for example, in the Carolinas, and it obviously creates big pollution problems. So there's all those kinds of problems. When it comes to climate change, it's an interesting problem because, because one thing that people tend not to understand is the methane problem is actually quite distinct from the carbon problem. So the, the warming that we now, because methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon, but has a much shorter lifetime in the atmosphere. And about a quarter of the warming that we now have is actually coming from methane. It's a methane warming. So, so we have to control carbon from a climate point of view because the impacts go on for so long. But we have to control methane because methane will spike very, very quickly in terms of pushing up that, that temperature. So the less we have carbon <coughs> under control, the more important it is to have methane under control. But people tend to sort of like to talk about all the greenhouse gases together, and that's actually, that's actually quite misleading. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> so I get the sense that you have, or that the lack of uh, awareness for the future is part of us now as a society. I think that that goes along with evolution and not having to worry about the future as much. And I'm not sure if it's possible to stop that or if you were to stop that, you'd be diverting and evolution. 
Well, again, I think it's very hard to think about the future. Somebody made this, made this point. You know, as like people say, Yogi Berra used to say, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. I mean, uh, but with a lot of these problems, if we, if, we, if we were only more conscious of the present, actually things would be much, much, much better. Um, so um, it, this goes into this chain of causation and complicity that I was talking about, that in a world in which money, power is affected almost instantaneously when you flip a light switch or you buy a product, uh, what you're doing now in real time matters enormously, right? whatever it is the future people will want. All right. Yes, round two. Um, earlier, if I understood correctly, you were talking about... Oh, please, louder. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so earlier you were talking about how it's important to have a measured response because it's really illogical for us as individuals to have anything else. However, in my studies of the Anthropocene, a measured response is really going to not be enough. Just, I mean... For, for the fact that we are in the sixth greatest mass extinction, we are using all these domesticated things. I mean, we can measure, we can say, I'm not going to eat meat, but if we don't have something like top-down policy or you know, a, a big, big social change, then I feel like we're not going to be able, and, and in a term it comes from sustainability, but more so resiliency. Do you, do you think that we should actually act now to prevent these things, or do you think that's just impossible at this point that we're going to have to learn to be well, resilient? So, so again, I think we don't really know. And I think what's interesting is, I mean, so these are sort of puny examples compared to what we're talking about with the prophecy. But people are very, very bad at predicting really significant social change. So nobody saw the collapse of communism, for example. Uh, almost every major, I mean, the impact that computerization has had on American society for good and for ill, was, and nobody had a clue about, about, about that when they, you know, when they started selling personal computers or something. So to me, this is also, this is kind of a message of hope and optimism, you know, is that, it, that it's just as wrong to be pessimistic about the impacts of your action as to be optimistic about them. And that's why it returns us to the importance of acting on our values. And we'll see, you know, what 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 the circus brings us. Oh, Nate's got a question. So I guess we better take it. Uh-oh. No, I think it's time to stop. <laughs> um, I'm just, uh, so there's this debate about whether individual action or sort of social political action, somebody mentioned that, which of those, and you said both, we need to do both. And, and I'm kind of wondering about your diagnosis and your solution. It seems to me it might be, it sounds more individualistic. It sounds like you know, with our agency, we, it's, we, we don't feel like we're killing people in 2050 or 200 like we feel if we ran somebody over. And, and then they, so that sounds kind of individualistic. That the problem is a lack of individual agency. And, and, connection with the harm that we're collectively causing. And then your solution, although I don't I haven't read this stuff years really, but the green virtues again sounds like you know aligning your your life with your values. And that again sounds kind of individual. I could just think people who you know who think it's politics, it's capitalism, it's economics, systems, it's more of the big stuff that and you know I can Live according to my values, but that's not going to do anything. Well, I mean, it's going to make me feel better. It's going to make me be a better person. But I mean, I, you did say that if a lot of people start doing this, and the politicians respond, but really? I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, look. So here's the thing. So living according to your values is, I mean, that isn't necessarily a retreat to private life because. You could do public life. Yeah, because one of the things I'm talking about is the erosion of the public-private distinction. It's pretty much ablated in that, in, that, in that sense. So somebody who says, I'm just living according to my values, so you know, I have nothing to do with politics and I don't vote and I never talk to people about my... I mean, that, that's not the same values as somebody who's, right, who's, living, who's living according to their, to their values. 
The other thing is when people make this contrast, it's kind of a weird contrast to me because it's like, well, you say, live according to the green virtues. I say, smash capitalism. And I say, okay, now, okay, okay, let's smash capitalism. Now, what do I do when I wake up tomorrow morning? Right? I mean, in some sense, we're always, we are individuals in social relationships with other people. That is our lives. And you can describe it however you want as political action, individual, blah, 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 blah. But, but the point is, that's what we have control over, is our own lives. And, uh, and, the, and, and when you've gone very far down the road to the erosion of agency, which is where I think we are, and what I see as the fundamental crisis of the time, then you have to go back and reset and ask, what is it that I have control over? And it's fundamentally how I live. And if, uh, I think if you have a society in which people are living according to their own values, <laughs> I think that's a pretty good place to stop. Uh, so let's thank our speaker again.